Santa Barbara and the uh, Wi-Fi is extended and the internet is extended all the way to New Zealand so we can pick up a conference with a retired endurance athlete who from a very young age, I'm taking it, uh, took up cycling. And uh, the, the, the thoughts that I have to share on cycling is imagine being a kid, like I, I did some individual sports like golf, but you have a break in the action after every shot. Um, the hardest sport I've ever done was outrigger canoeing. And the main reason it was so difficult is because your mind could never rest. You were on the go. It wasn't a safety issue. It was a timing and your team depended on you to be timing. But in the case of, of Steven Swart, Swart and the cyclists, whether you're a recreational cyclist on country roads or you're a competitive cyclist in the Tour de France, every second uh, could be a, a significant effort and every second you have to be a pay, paying attention to exactly where you are. And that, that could mean six hours uh, on a day uh, for, th you know, maybe not six hours per day, but over the course of three weeks, many, many long days. And then your diet, of course, your sleep, your massages, getting to your hotel, everything has to happen like clockwork. So it's a very uh, intense type of a lifestyle. Uh, Stephen, maybe you could introduce yourself and, and share if anything that I shared is, is a, a valid uh, look at the sport that uh, you did for so many years. Yeah, um, my name's uh, Steve Swartz. So I've, uh, I've a retired ex-professional cyclist. Um, yeah, it was the way you're explaining it there. There's there's obviously period, a lot of period of time where uh, do take place. They're not, uh, you know, it's probably like uh, the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of it's like that, but there's 20% of it that's a little bit more relaxed. But uh, I think it's it's like any other any other job I've, I've found now that you, you do outside, well, that I've learned to do outside cycling after retirement, um, the principles and all that mm -hmm. remain the same to a, to, to a degree. Could, could you take us, Stephen, um, from the your first interest in cycling and how many years that took before you were doing competition and maybe along the way you changed your life to become a more serious person and all those uh, facets that I talked about, the nutrition, the sleep, the recovery, all those types of things. Well, I mean, I think any any young kid when they're growing up, you know, they uh, they're led to to do some kind of outside activity, sport wise. You know, uh, I mean, I I started playing soccer when I was, you know, sort of early age, 10, 11, 12 sort of thing on a Saturday morning. Uh, you know, because it's a, it was a thing to do, or the other the other big sport that New Zealand's known for is rugby, but uh, I sort of didn't really fit that mould. Uh, and then it's sort of, because my brother was uh, a big time cyclist over here, he's 10 years older than me, and it's sort of one thing led to another. You know, you start slowly and... You have our club races over here. You join a, a club, a club team, so to speak. You know, in, a, in the little towns that we we lived in, it was in the seventies. There, you know, cycling was was quite big. You know, you didn't have all the the other major sports to. You know, the, the choices for activities were quite limited. You know, um, you didn't have all these new new age sports at the time. So, you know, cycling Tri had a, didn't exist for the most part no. when, you, when you were doing a 70s thing. No, that didn't start until the uh, until the 80s. So, I mean, you know, the clubs were really healthy, you know, that, you know, so when you from clubs and then you went to a district event or, uh, you know, join up every weekend, it was a whole community that sort of got around and evolved and everyone sort of knew one another. It was, it was great back then. And competition was fierce, and and a lot of good riders, you know, um, came through the ranks and, you know, stomp stamped their mark overseas. And it was what, a good, it was good times. Team, what did your team consist of, Stephen? Um, 
was your brother around, your dad, uncles, friends? How did you uh, get yourself with your bike in shape and, and get uh, and get picked up and all those types of things? Uh, well, so, yeah, I was sometimes with my brother, um, he, even though he was probably a lot of it was at a different level because he was he was in an older generation. Um, but friends that I, that I used to ride with in my same category, age category, you know, we used to train together, um, you know, sometimes, uh, well, a lot of times go to the they are to the races with them, you know, just get picked up and away we go. Sometimes we're gone for the day, sometimes the weekend, depending on when we were riding. So you were developing in terms of being away from your family, which I think is really important for young people to do, which was a blessing for me. My dad sent me over to France when I was 16. And then the parents of and friends and family of the people I stayed with on these exchanges they allowed me to grow because there was a lot less pressure sometimes than your own parents. There was more freedom and learning and treating me as a young adult. So that was very helpful. Did you, uh, did you realize the, the, well, well, first of all, was there more freedom when you went away on these trips and uh, did you realize how beneficial that was to you? Uh, probably not at the time, um, uh, because it was just the thing that everybody did because staying at home, he wasn't going to achieve anything because there was nothing to stay home because these races that we used to have when we were growing up it was like that was the race for that weekend you know we might we might have to travel a couple hundred miles to get there but you stayed home all you did was train or ride your bike by yourself yeah yeah did you um when i sent you the um information and the press releases on my um my first big research study called the aging athlete and i mentioned the uh, number the percentage of athletes who are still doing regular physical activity uh, starting the week that they leave their high performance sport whether you're a russian gymnast retiring at 18 or a general contractor retiring at age 58 um, it's it, the research that i've done which is 11 years now shows that about uh, less than 10 percent of these high performance people are maintaining a regular physical activity after they leave. Uh, how did how did that hit you? And, and is that something you had thought about before you heard it from Sifu Salem over here in California? No, I mean, I, I guess uh, for me, it's sort of, you know, when I when I stopped competitively, it's it stopped dead in the water there for a few years. I didn't really um uh, do anything i mean more my focus went on to was to my uh to my next venture so that i didn't allow i didn't take the time i didn't i didn't allow any time for that were you in your uh late 20s or 30s at that time uh beginning of the 30, early 30s yeah and how yeah. how was your uh, uh sort of how, so finish your thought and then i'll ask you a question I mean, I had always made a, a point of uh, when I, after I turned professional and sort of where things led me to, I sort of made a, a goal that if I hadn't uh, really made it to a, a good level, you know, to a, that I would, um, at 30 years of age, um, I would just stop pursuing that and uh, move on. So is that something you assessed, uh, like in baseball, they have spring training in, in uh, the United States and other countries as well. Is there a, something like a spring training and cycling where you reassess where you are and, and what your performance might be based on uh, your, your wattage and your weight and your injuries and your drive, et cetera? Not really. We didn't, you know, all these new tech techniques like wattage and that, you know, it's, it's still a little bit foreign to, to me because it wasn't available then. Um, I mean, the, 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 probably the only thing we really had was heart rate monitors to work off. Um, but no, not spring training wise, no, it wasn't anything like that. You know, that you would you would go to a like a, a camp a training camp uh, prior to the to the season, uh, maybe, very, you know, like for me, 
before Christmas, we would have a get together and then return home, carry on, and then we would either they had regroup again prior just to the season beginning and fine tune thing. And but you've really done the the bulk of your your uh, work by by then anyway. Could you take us through your um, your time of entering, you know, moving from amateur status um, and what you were doing in amateurs to getting uh, invited to uh, a team, a professional team? Yeah, I probably worked a little bit different over here. Like for our, as an amateur back in our day, uh, we we worked a forty hour a week as well, and then trained on top of that. Um, so. Yeah, unless I just happen to have a flexible um, company that allowed me to take two half days a week, and I was able to do a little bit extra in, in the week in the afternoons, um, which was which was great. So that was in but, your yeah, uh, early, once, early and mid twenties. Yeah, mid twenties. Yeah. And but that's a lot of a lot of guys, you know. Like back then, every, all the training was because uh, a lot of our season took took place in the winter. We don't have super harsh winters here, so you can ride at night. It's dark, can be cold, but uh, you know. So a lot of a lot of the a lot of the training back then was undertaken under lights. So um, when you're training as an amateur. Uh, did you have to win a few competitions before you um, moved into the professional ranks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, once I got started getting selected for national teams and tra and uh, traveling overseas, you know, and the results, then obviously uh, it sort of uh, got traction from there. When, what was your first trip to Europe and, and where'd you go and what was that about? I was um, eight, 18 years old and that was to the uh, Junior World Championships in Italy. And how, so, how long a race would that have been? Uh, well, we did everything back then. We did uh, the, 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 the track racing and the road racing. You know, we'd only sent, I think it was six riders and we sort of packaged everything up that everyone multitasked on all, on all sides of it to, to, to a high degree. But that's just the way it is. That's the way it worked down here. And uh, what what year was that? And then um, what what happened uh, based on your uh, your your times, et cetera, in, um, in Italy? Uh, that was that was 1982. Uh, we first of all, uh, we got to I live probably 100 kilometers away from um, where the manager of the team was appointed and he decided that the guys that are going were going to go and get like a training camp for six weeks prior. So all the riders from that were selected from around New Zealand, uh, we all got to base in the one place. Uh, we got billeted out with different families and he found us a, like a part-time job so we worked in the mornings and we trained in the afternoons what? so it wasn't still like the like like an amateur would be these days where it's basically just training so you're talking about the 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 several weeks five weeks etc that was in new zealand before italy that's correct yes yeah. so that we did that for a six-week period to build up um, our, build ourselves, you know, so he can monitor us. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of team time trialing because that was a, one of the specific events at the uh, Junior World Championships. So we were concentrating a lot of that. Did a lot of uh, track training. Uh, just all quite quite a lot of things that I hadn't been uh, had actually done before in the past, and that actually suited me that sort of structure, you know. That sort of environment, uh, a bit, a bit, uh, a bit military based for the first time, instead of just flying off the whim on you by yourself. The, the technical side of of teamwork is, you know, one of the most important things that they talk about in in the Grand Tour. 
Um, how, how does one learn that? Is the coach, this is, you know, you didn't have earpieces back in, uh, in 1982, I'm guessing, to hear from your coach. So no. how, how are you learning? Is it meetings before and after the, the day where you're learning about this? And maybe there's a captain with you that's giving you uh, orders along the way. Is that, is that what you folks were doing in the 80s? Uh, yeah, I mean, I say if you're taking that that initial those initial steps, there's no real team captain because we're all green as one another. So the, the 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 coach that was following us, you know, he would take notes and obviously would sit down and have a meeting where we could improve. Um, and that's just the the you know the incremental steps how it worked. Nobody knew any different. How how long? Um when you were competing as a pro and you're doing a team time trial, for example, the Tour de France, how long is the head person in the head and before they, they drop back? I'm guessing they drop to the fine, the all the way in the back. It, it, can, it can, that can vary. I mean, you know, uh, there's guys that think they're going to have a great day when they first start and it, they turn out they don't. So if you're feeling stronger, you generally try to, you know, prolong your turn at the front, not to burn yourself out, but to make the most of it, knowing that you're going to recover by the time you come back. It is, op it's it's probably the the best option to go all the, to drift all the way back. There's normally nine riders, but you might have a couple of riders that are having real bad days and they can't they can't pull through anyway, so they'll just leave a gap open up, and then allow that rider to follow in and you really generally instead of looking behind your, sh your shoulder you're just keeping an eye when you're drifting back that as soon as you see a gap that you know may know that's where you've got to fit in is it so it's, would it be along the lines of two to two to four minutes at the head oh it wouldn't even be that you know you if if you're super super strong you you may do in a in a in, in certain situations, but generally you're rolling over within, say, 30 seconds to a minute. Very short, yeah. Do you, um, yeah. Do you have any anecdotes from your time as a junior about um, perseverance, teamwork, um, exciting times that you, you wish to share? Oh, well, I mean, the, the whole uh, trip to, like, say, to the junior worlds in Italy, you know, coming from the other side of the world, well, it's totally different. You know, the language is different, the food's different. Um, so we were just like uh, tour, tour um, sporting tourists, really. And you, would you, would you meet a, good, another you know, hundred athletes, one hundred and fifty junior athletes? How many juniors do you think? Yeah, I, I honestly, it's so long ago, I couldn't tell you. But it was it was an eye opener, you know. We, when we first arrived in Italy, we had we did another six weeks of training of a training camp there, staying in this one one hostel, <laughs> and that was great, you know. Um, just it almost felt like uh, being a European for a, a little bit of the time and, and adapting to their ways because a we weren't working, b we were solely concentrated on the worlds and we basically trained twice a day, and a, a nap in the afternoon so everything was really structured did you take a, a number of bikes for each uh, rider over there uh basically two just the, your road bike and uh, your track bike track and a road so there's at that time there's no mountain bike for the mountains no bike for the t uh, time trial <laughs> no 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 nothing specific like that do you um, remember the first time where the pressure was so extreme that you were in awe, basically, of, of the pressure of the training, the competition, uh, the looks that other people gave you, whether they're on your team or your competitors? That wouldn't have been then, uh, that year, because I felt relatively confident, you know, I'd done, I'd done the work and felt okay. I didn't know how I would go or how I'd perform. Um, how did you folks do the road race? No, we went anything 
of a, a top caliber back then. But I mean, I, I fared okay in the road race. Uh, just, there just happened to be a, a big crash on the finishing straight where uh, I just got tangled, tangled a little bit. But for a Kiwi, uh, you know, anything in the top 20s is, is, a, is a great result. And back then, you know, I, man, I managed to do that. In the top 20. Fantastic. Um, did, yeah. did, yeah. You, did you say that you got tangled, but you didn't fall or you did fall? No, I didn't actually fall. I was I got some rider hit me, and back then we used to have toe clips. And for some reason, the the toe clip, the strap came out of the holder, so my foot wasn't actually tied into the pedal, so I couldn't actually gain maximum power. So therefore, I was you know I had to drift to the line. I, I you know I can only do this so much to the line, but that's where everybody was sort of going over the top of me. Otherwise, you know, the the positioning wise, I could have been higher in the in the in the standings. That's good. So you. Were but I was happy. But I was happy to be there. But I mean, to say we were, you know, a lot of the a lot of the racing back then was dominated by the Eastern Blocs. You know, the East Germans and the Russians, and you know, we looked up at them. You know, going, wow, these guys, they don't look like they're uh, sixteen or eighteen years old. There, you think there might have been some. Um age age fabrication who knows who knows no that's all spec that's all speculation <laughs> but they they had uh they had more of a need of a razor than you did is what your thoughts are well i mean yes it's amateur but were they were they they were uh you know the whole regime back then they were classes amateurs but they were training and living like a professional correct yeah so you know what's straight away you know you've got a you know you're you're on the back foot without even uh, you know before you even line up when you folks got back with your team uh, to new zealand did you um keep keep going as a team or or, or did you say goodbye and and you just did your back to your normal competitions yeah correct the, we didn't stay as a team because that was just uh picked as a national team so once you, you know, we had guys from all over New Zealand, so they go back home and back to doing what they normally do and likewise. And then, you know, the competitions just carry on as normal. But back then, you know, then the the, the, the following year, the Junior Worlds were actually in, in New Zealand. So that's, oh. that's where we got, the, that's where the next selection came from. Were you, were you on that team? Yeah. Yeah, you want to share how that uh, that event went? Uh, it, I mean, as for uh, for New Zealand itself, they did really well. They they managed to actually uh, get a gold medal on the track. I wasn't involved then. I was only specifically on the road uh, for the team's time while in the road race. I um, I'd actually. Um, Purposely, about four or five months beforehand, was changed. So I was actually being half a professional and taking working half days and training the the, the rest. But you know, I mean, so I uh, what I know now is I basically burnt myself out before I even got to the to the event. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I overtrained. You know, I was actually at some at some stages. I was uh, performing as as good in in the in the races that we had here in New Zealand. You know, I was giving the the senior riders a hard time, and I was only a junior. So um, when I interviewed Charlie French, who's um, if he's still alive, he'd be uh, in his mid nineties now, and he he won Ironman Hawaii every year from 86 until you know recently uh, he may still be doing it yeah. he's kind of an amazing uh a senior and been an amazing guy his whole life he actually was part of inventing he's the one who bent the uh the original arrow bars um when he was working for scott usa um mm -hmm. and back in the 80s and you know they got to greg lamont and they tried him and it and it he did real well um he told me that in the 80s, because of this triathlete and coach by the name of Mike Pig, P 
T-I-G-G, his, yeah. his answer was more miles, more laps, more hours. So he was the more is more type of a coach. So was that the, um, was that the paradigm that, that your elite coaches were thinking uh, was the way to go back in the 80s? Not, not the one that, um, not the one that I was taking advice from. Um, the, the well, I think the one that you're reverting to, that Mike Pick, that's more of the uh, the Eastern Bloc philosophy, and they they undertook that kind of regime. I know there was the riders here uh, later on in the eighties where they started trying that technique, but it never really worked out for them. I think they are missing one of the uh, elements out of it all. But. Well, how, how and when? Uh, I mean, go ahead, finish your thought, and then I'll try another one. Um, but I mean, yeah, for me, it was, I was doing a lot of specific, tra specific training. And my biggest problem was, of what I know now, is I wasn't allowing my one day of uh, one day recovery between doing massive amounts of work isn't enough sometimes you need a week maybe longer but you know i was just too uh too naive well i was naive of that or wasn't i didn't have enough uh ad advice on that yeah so you know the the cells of our body and the and the entire physiological system can get tired and that can make the brain and our focus, our attention get tired as well. And the same thing can happen here. Imagine somebody being in uh, some uh, domestic situations where their kids a uh, challenge, they're not getting uh, their peace and quiet, let alone sleep back at home. And that's mm. going to translate mm. over to uh, the physiological, the, the, the legs not being able to do with what they, they need to do. So how old were you and and maybe a coach shared this or you learned it some other way before you learned about how all this mind and body and spirit and being in the flow zone versus being in a, in a zone that's not working for you and what you can do to um, remedy that how how old were you when you started learning a little bit about this type of thing Pro probably after I turned professional that I really started to, to learn about it. Um, but it still took me a long time. There's still a lot of uh, trial and error. And it's a fine line. Sometimes you you took took the easy route too much and paid the price. Yeah. Or sometimes you took the other the other way too much. So it's a, it's quite a balancing act. Yeah. yeah. Can you take us through um becoming a pro a pro what age you were and and uh, how you made that determination was it with your friends family your coach how did that decision get made and how did you move into that new realm well i, I it was um, obviously i had a reasonable amount of talent in new zealand here and uh, once i moved up to the senior level and was writing um the the coach who had a lot to do with with my my brother and who one of the the national road coach obviously knew my abilities as well and through their connections throughout the racing in Europe and stuff like that he managed to find me a, a situation one of the other one of the other leading Kiwi road riders was supposed to take that spot um, he'd shown. You know he had massive ability massive abilities but uh, he wasn't the sort of guy that liked to travel uh, leave, leave home you know he was uh, he was sort of uh, he was a big fish in a small pond but didn't, didn't like uh, going outside like that so that's where the opportunity arose for me and um, and I really took it because uh, my brother in 84 was you know, he was probably heads and shoulders above anybody else here in New Zealand and should have been in the Olympic road race in Los Angeles, but uh, because of politics and uh, was left off. 
and um, that's where I decide. That's where I sort of already decided in my mind that I wasn't going to rely on, um, um, like a national selection to uh, pave my way going forward. You know, uh, it's going to be up to me. Can you can you share a little bit so, about your brother, his name, and and what what he did as a pro, and then how he transitioned into being uh, uh, a non a non professional athlete? Well, he was never he was never um, a professional. He was he was top he was a top amateur. He um, Jack, his name's probably more well known in New Zealand than mine is. Because he was, you know, back then in the 80s, 70s and 80s, uh, you know, national coverage and the amount of sports, you know, cycling got a reasonable amount of coverage. So he, you know, at certain times of year when, the, when there was big races on the, on the cards, you know, he always made, his name was always present. Um, he won the, um, he's won the national championships, you know, road, road cycling championships three times. Um, he's won the major uh, stage races here. Anything, anything that go, you know, any, any, basically any race that's on the cars here, he had won. Um, they had a the national selectors had a, a criteria for 1984 for to to actually get a, a selection for the uh, for the Olympic Games, and it was all based around the one race, the National Road Championships, where he, um, because he was such a, a strong, he was rider, everyone just marked him and they just sort of followed him around. And uh, there was a few smart ones there that took the opportunity and obviously gained, uh, where at the end of the day he got frustrated and, and just put his hands up and pulled out and the race was over for those guys. But... Maybe it wasn't the smartest thing. Maybe uh, a bit more gruesomeness might have been required. Then they had a, uh, a, a trial race a couple of days later for the team time trial. And he basically was riding the team time trial on his own because they had two teams as a selection squad. And he rode the... I remember following in the van. He... Uh, the, the other guys that the, he was put with for the selection for the selection race, he rode the whole thing on his own. They just sat on him. He was just like a motorbike. Wow. But, yeah. But, I mean, there was the determination for him to try and, you know, uh, resolve resolve the issues. But there was, I think there was a couple of selectors there that had already sort of had a, had a political path that they were taking. What, what did Jack do um, and, and how did he transition into a, a normal life after his amateur career? Well, he always, he had his own building company anyway when he was writing. So basically he just, once uh, he did stop writing, he just continued on with that. Good. So we'll, we'll come back with uh, part two in just a second. So... Sifu Slim with Stephen Swart from New Zealand, and we'll be right back. 